Great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, you could just please mute yourself and, uh, for the time being. If you're not speaking, that would be super helpful just to eliminate background noise and feedback. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, my name is Emily. I'm the local police economy coordinator at Code Pink. Um, and this is the local police economy community call. Um, some of you know, if you've been here before, that typically Jody joins us and she will hopefully be joining us um, later on in the call. Um, but I had nothing on it. So she'll join in later. Um, but Jody is the coordinator. Jody Evans is her name and um, has been. Um, I don't know, midwifing, doula ing this local piece of economy work for quite some time now. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a real joy to be able to uh, be learning with her, from her, and uh, to be in this work and learning with and from all of you as well. Um, so as people are doing, you can see me, um, people are introducing themselves in the chat. Please continue to do that. Oh, Bellevue, Washington. I used to live in Washington. Um, and I'm going to uh, put some announcements in the chat. I know oftentimes we're often like, you know, talking right up to the end and the announcements that just kind of slide in there. So um, to avoid them being missed, I will put them in the chat now and kind of go through that and then we'll dive in. Dive in. Um, first announcement is just the link to register for um, our next local peace economy call. These happen every other Wednesday at this time. So our next call is June 19th. Um, if you want specific support on um, talking through um, a local police economy project idea that you have, please reach out to me. Um, uh, me, as well as uh, Jody, would love to talk to you and support you and um, help you get what you need. Um, so feel free to reach out. Um, we do have a local police economy list sir, that um, you can continue chatting with folks in between calls. Um, what you're learning. I know there are some great um, Tim. Um, sent a great email uh, last week or the week before, I guess two weeks ago, about what was it, World Bee Day or something like that. And I shared a photo of like a little bee hotel um, in my neighborhood, just like sharing where the local peace economy is around us um, and just any questions you have, any support you need, great way to stay connected. Um, we have the day in RSVP for, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Code Pink's um, Gaza Summer School that's going on. It kicked off this week on Monday night. Um, so that's every other one. Um, the next one on June, Jody and I will be talking about local peace economy stuff. So we would love to have you there. Love to have you um, in the chat, in the breakout room, sharing all the wisdom that you've been gleaning from your own journeys uh, along the way. Um, and continue to learn, learn with you and, and learn together. Um, and then the last one is, I shared this last time as well, but um, a recent Pink Tank article um, or Code Pink blog post that I wrote about um, war as weaponized confusion and the peace economy being an antidote to that. Um, and I think that's it for that. And the last thing I'll do before we dive in is um, I shared this last week. It's a something called Padlet. This is just another way of introducing ourselves. Um, so I'm going to put a link in the chat here. Um, and then I'll clear my screen so you can see. There um, is a noise in the background from some people. Yeah, if you if you could just mute yourself, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, I think that may have done it. I see a few more people unmuted, so if you wouldn't mind just muting yourself, if you're there, that'd be great. Um, and so this resource, I put the link in the chat. Feel free to click on it. It's called Padlet, and it's just so another way. I thought it was a really cool visual way to see where people are and also get connected if you're near someone or you know someone who lives there who's interested in local peace economy work. Um, so let me just give me a second here to share my screen. I can show you how this works. All right, so you all can see my screen, right? Just give me a thumbs up. Yep, okay, cool. So this is called Padlet. And so you can see we have a few entries on here already, these little pink dots. This is me here in Denver. Um, and the invitation is to add yourself onto this map and then we can kind of see where people are. And um, if you want to add a couple of details about what kind of work you're doing um, in terms of local peace economy work and how you do that is in the bottom right-hand corner here, um, there's this kind of magenta circle. If you click that, you can search your town or wherever you live by name. For example, again, I'm in Denver. 
I would click that. It says write something incredible. Write something incredible. Um, I would write, you know, your name if you're um, willing to share that. Otherwise, it'll come up as anonymous. Um, and maybe what you're interested in, um, why you're interested in local peace economy work, if you're involved in any local peace economy projects. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. I know we have a lot of new people um, to this call here tonight, and that's totally okay. But we'd love to just see where people are, um, where you're calling in from, and it's a great way to, to feel connected and actually get connected um, locally as well. Um, anyone have any questions about that? Oh, and when you're done writing, you can just hit Publish right here. You know, Any questions? Let's check the chat. Okay. All right. Thanks, Quanta. I saw your message. All right. And in the spirit of slowing down, um, as we often do or always do, we'll kind of take a grounding moment together, take a grounding breath, and start with a piece of culture. Um, so today I wanted to share a poem by beloved Mary Oliver. I know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with her. Um, and this poem is called Mornings at Blackwater. So I'm just going to take a, take a grounding breath and invite you to, to do the same with me for a moment. So part of a lot, a lot of this work is feeling into our bodies, feeling into our sensations, feeling into our emotions, which requires just slowing down. Okay. So again, this is Mornings at Blackwater. For years, every morning, I drank from Blackwater Pond. It was flared with oak leaves and also, no doubt, the feet of ducks. And always it assuaged me from the dry bowl of the very far past. What I want to say is that the past is the past and the present is what your life is. And you are capable of choosing what that will be, darling citizen. So come to the pond or the river of your imagination or the harbor of your longing and put your lips to the world and live your life. And that poem will be shared out in the follow-up email as well, if you want to refer back to it. But I wanted to open today with that, because as we talk about self-responsibility today, I want us to ground and remember that joy is also our responsibility, and that communing with the natural world is, and remembering that we're not separate from it is our responsibility. And we have that choice that Mary Oliver talked about in that poem. Um, and I think Mary Oliver is a great example um, of that and really invites us into that responsibility if you're familiar with the, the breadth and depth of her work. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Um, and we'd love to turn it all over to you and just hear a bit about, um, for those of you who have, who have been here before, um, what's been up for you since the last call or a few calls, what you've been learning. I know our last call was super juicy. We had a great speaker, Glendra Davis, about talking about community. Um, what you've been learning about community or any anything else along the lines of the local peace economy. And if you're new here, I'd also just love to hear a little bit about what brought you here. What is your curiosity about learning more about local peace economy? Maybe what you, you're already learning. You don't necessarily, you're not, it's not necessarily a new concept to you. Maybe it's just your first time here. So yeah, we'd just love to hear um, from you all for a few minutes. What's what's on your, your minds and your hearts coming into tonight? Um, I'll say a few things if no one else is going to start us off here. Um, am I good, Emily? Can you can you hear me and see me? Yeah, we got okay. you. Okay. Um, without um, going into talking too much, um, I kind of uh, I've become a, a Marxist and a, I guess a committed leftist, uh, maybe a leftist dirtbag a little bit for um, – uh, whatever that means, um, or for whatever that's worth, um, fairly recently, it's been a long process. Um, I found that, um, I'm very, um, I take very strong positions now and, I'm um, feeling very principled and, 
a consequence of taking these strong positions is being able to um, defend them against people who aren't so open to what they consider consider kind of radical ideas. Uh, from a young age, I think I approach this uh, more with an interest in a um, uh, gender and uh, racial issues, race issues. Um, and then um, and then came at the class, uh, the sort of the class problems that we have um, in our society. And um, so, uh, as I said, it's just been a long process. I, I feel like that's maybe a little bit inverted from where some people come from. It, um, not to like sound like I'm pandering or something, but I just kind of intuited a lot of things at a young age. And then um, it took me a while to uh, get older and discover that those things that I intuited at a young age were in fact correct about problems with equality and misogyny and um, discrimination and those sorts of things. And uh, just what's going on now is so blatant and i really didn't the cynic in me did not think that i could be surprised by what our political leaders are doing and saying right now but uh somehow they have done it um i'm disgusted with both parties and capitalism in general and uh that's where i'm at right now and uh that's all i have to say at this time thanks william for sharing for thank you yeah happy to have you Monta, it's your hand up don't forget to unmute. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey. And I am a Rotarian, so I've been involved with uh, peace actually since the first uh, Gulf War and uh, more heavily. But I also started, I've been in this country for 53 years. So I started way back during the Vietnam. So I've been a long-term peace activist. And uh, right now I'm involved in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons with, through ICANN. And, um, you know, a variety of uh, peace uh, activities through Rotary and outside of Rotary as well as I am a member of the uh, Braver Angels of America that's trying to help to, to depolarize our political atmosphere. So that's that's where I am. I hope I didn't take more than two minutes. Thank you. Not at all. Thanks, Ponto. Anyone else want to share? I see them in the chat. I live in Las Vegas, a place that deeply relies on the war economy and contributes to the genocide in Palestine via the casino industry. Yeah, yeah, that's a, something that we talk about um, a lot here is where is the war economy in your community? And Jody has a really potent story about that on our uh, radio show episode, which I can share in the chat um, a little bit later about that's how she really got into this work is she was like, where is the war economy in um in her community in California, and it was um, youth, uh, houseless youth on the street, and how that project grew um, to become a huge project of community care. Um, so it sounds like you're already doing some mapping there in Las Vegas. Um, anyone else want to share? Rob? Yeah, I'll share just a little bit. Um, my name is Rob. I live in Kansas City. Um, I felt uh, some similarities with what Will was saying about, um, you know, just at a young age, uh, being, you know, just not not really content with the way things, you know, are. But um, more recently, um, yeah, Palestine has really radicalized me and opened my eyes. And um, I'm sorry that they, it, you know, I didn't see it sooner that this has been going on for so long. I feel like, how could I have been so blind to it? So, but, you know, I'm here now and I'm just wanna do everything I can to help, um, you know, whatever, whatever that means going forward. I'm not, I'm sort of new. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. And yeah, yeah you're speaking to a, um, a big piece of, um, 
Looks like someone's sharing their, looks like Fonte is sharing your screen. If you could just turn that off. Thank you. Um, a big piece of what we talk about in local peace economy work, in addition to all the work in, um, and alongside all the work um, you're doing with others in the community, there's also an internal process that we call the cycle of reconnection. And um, part of that cycle is grief. Um, so really, um, yeah, opening to the grief of um, how did I not see this sooner? Where was I? Um, I could have been doing more. I know I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but just speaking to a larger experience that I know that I've um, had myself as well um, and the grief of, of what's happening now. Um, yeah. We have one more hand that says your mom. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to change it on my phone. My That's name okay. is Laura. I live in Hi, Albany, Laura. New York. <laughs> and um, I, I just wanted to speak to um, the guilt that I think some of us are feeling about not getting involved sooner. Um, I know I saw a 60 Minutes episode about Gaza years and years ago. I can't even remember when it was, it was um, on air. And at that time, I was struck with the injustice of what was happening, but I also felt really helpless. And I think at this point in time, it's like a flashpoint because even if we feel helpless, we can't not act. And there's a collective feeling of that. And so I feel like we have to acknowledge that, that if we're just getting on board now, it's because there's hope that we could actually accomplish something kind of like with the BLM movement. I think I started being radicalized by that after like a, years and years of seeing injustice and feeling helpless about it. And then this is like a second awakening so I'm just hopeful that we can make societal change maybe sometime in my lifetime. Absolutely. Thank you, Laura. And yeah, thanks for sharing that. And yeah, again, tending to those feelings that are coming up and, um, and yeah, the local peace economy is a place where we can really take our power back, take our attention back and pivot out of the war economy into a peace economy um, in our communities and, um, see that work happening like very directly. Um, all right, it looks like we all will do Samuel, Dominique, and then Fern, and then we'll pivot at, and Leslie. Um, looks That'll be the stack. And then we'll pivot to our conversation on uh, individualism and self-responsibility, speaking of pivoting. Um, no pun intended. Um, yeah, okay, Samuel. I uh, found out about this. Um... I've been active with Code Pink Congress. I did not really know about this. I get you know, getting messages, and I just, just simply neglected and ignored them until now. And I realized what it was. Um, I think, though, uh, that ceasefire is the moral way to do it in Gaza. But I have a question first about the January. the The artist, the Persian artist that started that. They were doing the blog at the very beginning of January this year. And it looked like his deck, his home was in Topanga, but I'm not sure. I did a search under the artist's name and he was displaying something in Topanga, but the landscape looked a little like Topanga. Do you know, is that where he lives? I am not sure about that. That's something I can ask um, more about and get back to you with. Jody Evans knows him. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure um, you know. So it's the beginning of, of everything. And the Gaza situation, I feel very pessimistic. I think, I think, um, you know, I'm very cynical. I, for one thing, the ancestor of both humans and chimpanzees, where we must have been very warlike uh, ancestor, because we're, uh, we're, this is what we are. This is our human nature, unfortunately. We've been chanting Kyrie, and we've been chanting Dona Nobis Pachem for 2,000 years, and there's never been peace. It's just our nature. I don't know. We, we try to do everything we can, morally support the ceasefire, but then be sure that Israel's defended in case the ceasefire does not work. To put an iron dome or and worse comes to worse, bring in trainers to train uh, the Israelis to make their own weapons so we don't have to be involved anymore. We need to take care of our own people. 
so uh, and uh, defend our borders, but we have to do that after there's a, a a ranked choice election of every literate person in the world as to how to handle war and peace and have the United Nations involved in it. It's so sad that the United States House this uh, went against the International Criminal Court. We will be next. We'll have to be sanctioned if the Senate goes ahead with it. That's going to really be bad for us. Thanks, Samuel, for sharing. Yeah, I think um, something that um, something that we we move from in this local peace economy work is that the war economy is actually not our natural state, um, and that in doing this peace economy work, we can return to ways of being together that have been practiced by um, indigenous communities for time immemorial, uh, long before um, these systems of domination have, have really taken hold. Um, Dominique? Yeah, hi. Um, to um, say hello to Quanta, I feel very much like her. So I'm French by birth, and I've been here many years like her, and I'm a peace activist dealing with the same issues she's dealing with. But to uh, to echo Rob, who talked about grief, my work as an artist and a performance artist who brings together art, activism, and spirit, uh, I do a, a, a piece called Tears of the World, where um, you know I really invite people to share their grief together because I feel it's really important from my own experience as an artist from grief, I, I, I went into action and the grief was really uh, key to, to, to that. So, because I know a lot of people who are kind of frozen by what's happening and if they can get in touch with their grief, then, you know, truly and collectively, uh, it helps them kind of move on and, and be more, you know, contribute more to our, you know, society. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing, Dominique. Yeah, we shared that link out um, a few weeks ago, a few calls ago. Um, if you're uh, willing, Dominique, please feel free to share your link in the chat to that again. Yeah, I will, um, because I just sent out a mailing about that very topic. So I will I will share it in the thanks. link. Thank you. Burn. Thank you. Yes, I'm interested in... Um, sharing about grief. I was never allowed to <laughs> um, be sad growing up. I always had to support everyone. Um, anyhow, I started um, my activism with Ralph Nader in before 1991. And we never expected to win or lose. It was just about sharing about corporate crime and oil and all that. And when 9-11 happened, I joined my 9-11 truth group and we would go down to ground zero. And I got the same kind of stuff that we get from this is nobody would believe that USA created a controlled demolition. And they blamed the black people like, like what's going on now. And this started in for me, like it started way before that, but it started in 1991 when um, Russia was um, whatever and, and Bush told Russia that NATO would not expand. And then, then they used all these wars to increase the military complex. I am here because I need support. I feel very alone, but I know I'm not alone. I write every day. Um, some of the people that come up to me when I take down these propaganda posters and someone in the, the temple next to where one of near me where I live came out of the temple and he told me even if even if um, Israel um, even if Hamas 
releases all the hostages, Israel has no intentions of stopping bombing. So it's not about it's not about Palestine. It's much bigger than that. And um, I every time someone comes over to me and shares, you know, their ang their anger at me for taking, I I get something from it. I mean, I understand. I, I I keep learning more, and I think I think the people that come up to me and tell me I'm crazy for the way I think, you know, uh, about um, for the Palestinians, um, for Hamas, who stood up for the Palestinians having their land returned to them. Um, I, I get something from each person who says something. Uh, and it's just much bigger than what's going on now. But, you know, I'm grateful that, that NATO will have a, um, a, a seminar in July because that's a major problem. This is all about, you know, um, Israel is violating the Constitution, uh, human rights laws um they want to be they want to take over the usa that's my opinion so um i really identify with all the speakers i really need help thank you for letting me share sorry for my anger i have a lot of anger <laughs> but I, no, I no, no apology needed for your anger bless you no apology needed for your anger. It's it's part of the process. And thank you for, for sharing the support that you need. And um, that's what we're here to do is support each other and learn together. And um, please reach out to Jody and me um, if there's specific support, support that you need. But yeah, the biggest, the biggest thing to remember is that you are not alone and we are not alone in this. And that's a lie of the war economy, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, uh, right after we hear from Leslie. Emily. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I feel like I just have to clear the air here a little bit. Um, I was in, it's my understanding that Code Pink's position is that is Israel is a settler colonialist project. Yep. Okay. Um, not to be contentious, but uh, when we start talking about Israel making weapons and defending borders, I feel like that's a little bit, it's counter to uh, what the goals of the organization are. Um. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing the link. But yes, that is that is the position of Code Pink, that Israel is a settler of colonial state. And Leslie will be our last um, share for now, and then we'll get into individualism and self-responsibility. Hello. Uh, this is my first uh, peace economy meeting. So um I'm trying to think about how to start to introduce myself. And um, I would say I'm an anti-speciesist. And I start with that because I believe that speciesism is the root of all isms. Um, so I'm an anti-racist, I'm a peace activist. Um, and everywhere I look, I see um, violations of what I think um, should be. Uh, so I was interested in this group because, uh, let's see, let me backtrack a little bit. When I was, I really started in my adult life, my first activism was animal rights. Um, but in thinking about this, I just remembered, I did start a group when I was in elementary school called Love Bugs of America. Mm -hmm. And it was a focus on um, pollution, uh, ending pollution. And we only had one meeting and that meeting was on some kind of a holiday, some kind of an Americanized holiday. Um, and where people were expected to put flags up. And so we drew flags on pieces of paper and took them around to the houses that didn't have flags. And now I won't wear a flag or display a flag unless it's upside down. And I think that's really bizarre that the Trumpers are now taking on the upside down flag because it just means your country's in great distress. And I believe our country is, and to have People like that using that symbol just blows my mind. That's a little bit of a backtrack. So in my animal rights work, one of the things that we did, and this was early on before you, before there were the cruelty-free um, markings on everything. I'm 62 years old. So this was back when I had to go to 
all kinds of different stores just to find something that wasn't tested on animals. Now it's pretty prominent and you can basically get it anywhere. But one of the things that we encouraged people to do was look at the ingredients on everything that they buy and trace it back to its source. Where does it, where did it come from? After animal rights, I got into environmentalism and it was kind of the same thing. Like, where did this product come from? And often you can trace them back to indigenous communities um, that have been displaced and had their resources stolen. So um, in looking at the world today, uh, and yes, Palestine is very much on my mind. I just got a shirt that said, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. I was thinking about Palestine. Um, but it's it just is a constant everywhere. So I'm just curious about this group and these meetings um, because I think that kind of work that I did previously and looking at the products that I consume and even knowing all that and having done all that, I'm still amazed at how much I purchased that doesn't really come from a local economy. Uh, um, you know, I, I go to Amazon to when I need something. Um, I mean, I do use some local trade groups, but for my basic needs, you know, I go to a, a retail grocery store that's a chain and, um, you know, I try to grow a little food, but it, it's it's very challenging. And even this work is challenging of trying to slow down enough to come to a meeting like this and be present. Um, I I did a I'm in the Gaza summer school. So that was a couple of days ago. And then last night I did um, the J Street lecture with the two brothers. And um, so I had three meetings in a row yeah. and it's feeling a little overwhelming, um, but I'm grateful for the chance to slow down and um, be here yeah. and, and learn from this, or this group. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, we're really happy to have you here. And um, yeah, I really appreciate what you shared about your journey and um, the way that it sounds like you're doing in your own way. I've already been doing a lot of mapping, which is one of the capacities that we talk about in the local peace economy workbook, um, which I know a lot of you are new. So if you're not familiar with that, I'll put those links in the chat and we'll be in the follow-up email. Um, but yeah, mapping, like where are we getting our needs met and um, how are we using our gifts and are we using them in service to the war economy? Or are we using them in service to the peace economy? So yeah, your story spoke to a lot of different things there. Um, so thank you to all who shared, super juicy. Time is, uh, time, we, time is, time is what it is um, and it is moving. Um, so I'm good, but I'm gonna move into our, our topic for tonight, which is um, one of our pivots, which if you're, if you're not familiar, there's, um, a list of pivots on our website. Um, we have that link here if you want to look at it. Um, and in our workbook that is really the, a foundation of the local peace economy work called the Pivots to Peace. And one of the pivots, it's really pivots in ways of being. Um, Jody talks about them as war economy addictions even, um, that we are kind of breaking um, these habits. Um, and Sorry, just doing a technical thing. Um, you know, breaking these habits and pivoting to ways of being that are supportive of peace and um, supportive in the, of the peace economy. Um, and one of the pivots that we see come up over and over again, and the reason we're focusing on it tonight is because it came up a lot in our last call. Thanks, Dominique, for showing the, um, the workbook. I have it here too. I just have too many, too many books stacked around me. Um, you can see it. Um, there's also a, a free version to download as well. Um, but yeah, this, this pivot of individualism, it's so ingrained in us, it comes up all the time and really gets um, kind of in the, in the way of, of building community. And so we wanted to focus on it. And like I said, it came up several times last week. Um, so I'm gonna start by reading this excerpt from this book, How We Show Up, uh, Reclaiming Family, Friendship and Community. I'm just gonna read a few um, paragraphs from it because I think it really speaks to um, this pivot and just want to bring in as many voices as possible, um, as many, um, yeah, wisdom shares as possible. And this is by Mia Birdsong. And I'll put um, a link to this in the follow-up email as well. But she says, 
I've come to understand that the things I want to do to be my best self and live my best life are also necessary for me to be in workable relationships with others. That means self-care, self-reflection, healing, and evolving. It means tapping into tremendous compassion for others and ourselves as we journey. It means committing to our own evolution and supporting the evolution of our loved ones as they support us. This work we have to do is also about re reorienting ourselves around what it means to be an individual. Our individuality is in fine with our connectedness. So the work of healing and growth happens both alone and in relation to others. We are the only ones who can decide we will heal and grow, but it's a collective process. The American dream is a clusterfuck of intersecting oppressions that function systemically and affect us individually. Capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy, all of which create offshoots like ableism, transphobia, ageism, and others, are embedded in the systems and institutions we all interact with, everything from housing to healthcare to media to jobs to education. But they are also embedded in each of us. The work of recognizing and excavating the toxicity of the American dream each of us has inside of us is lifelong work. It is work we must do alongside the specifically personal work of dealing with things like the fact that your father was critical or your mother was withholding or your uncle sexually assaulted you or you experienced abandonment as a child. These wounds, the specifically personal and the systemically personal, are intertwined. My calling to work towards social justice feels fundamentally joyful, but managing the impact of external and internalized oppression is both something I'm used to and something that exhausts and breaks my heart. It's a lot, and let me be clear about something. Not only is it not easy and not our fault, it's not fair. It's not fair that we inherit all this baggage, but as I remind my children when they get different sized pieces of cake, shit is not fair. We can certainly rail against what is unfair, things like hypercritical parents, not cake, and fight against injustice, things like racism, not cake. But at the end of the day, we, each one of us, are the only ones who can decide we are going to suffer less in the face of the wrongs that we have experienced and continue to experience. We can decide that our own experience of contentment, pleasure, and liberation is ultimately more important than being pissed about the fact that we shouldn't have to deal with it in the first place. Hmm. Again, that's how we show up by Mia Bird's song. And so I'll just share a few things about um, individualism and, and self-responsibility, this pivot, and then we'll go into breakout rooms. But um, the first thing I want to start with is this distinction that I think Mia Birdsong speaks to between the individual and the personal. Um, and she's talking about the personal nature of this work, as we see in the cycle of reconnection, especially like grief is deeply personal. How we give and experience care is deeply personal. How the war economy impacts us in our specific lives is deeply personal, but that does not mean that it is individual and we don't have to hold our grief alone. We can't experience, experience care alone. The healing, um, the healing isn't alone, but we have to be the ones to make the decision to live a life that's different from the one the war economy culture tells us to live. But we need to do that um, in collective and it's it's not doing that work is not just for us either it's also for the collective and when i first came across this pivot something that struck me is that the pivot is not from individual to community community is certainly a huge part of local peace economy work it has to be done in community we say all the time our last call was all about community um but this pivot is from individualism to self-responsibility because we cannot leave ourselves out of this work. And as Mia Birdsong talked about, we have to be able to be responsible for ourselves and our actions and actually to actually be able to be in community in a good way. We cannot be in community well if we cannot be responsible for ourselves. And we actually end up creating more work for the community when we try to be in community without being self-responsible. So self-responsibility really is a, door, a doorway into community. Um, and in this culture, self-responsibility is a lot of labor. Our entire culture is set up for us to live individually and therefore irresponsibly. Um, because individual, individualism is actually a really irresponsible way of living. And I'm constantly having to floss my brain, as Jody says, of all the ways I've been conditioned to think and act individually. Um, but one edge I also want to name here um, for this 
pivoting to self-responsibility that I think is easy to overlook and that I have felt in my own experience is that part of being responsible for ourselves is knowing our limits and our boundaries. And part of being self-responsible is knowing that we can't do everything. And this opens up the space for us to say yes to what we are actually in relationship with and responsible for. If you were, um, if you've been on past calls, you may have remember Jody talking about our sphere of concern, our sphere of influence. It's kind of that concept. Um, I know I personally can be really hard on myself and move into shame for not being able to do everything I feel like I should be doing. But I've learned that being in that kind of punitive relationship with myself is not actually allowing for responsibility either. Um, I think about this quote a lot um, that comes from a book called Community, The Structure of Belonging by Peter Bloch. Um, and he says, high control systems are unbearably soft on accountability. And in my mind, accountability is actually responsibility. Capitalism, colonialism, militarism, the prison industrial complex, this is all a high control system. And we're seeing every day, we're seeing it every day in Israel and Palestine, how there, the, there's a lack of accountability or responsibility in those systems. And so part of our work, um, sorry, I'm just, uh, something came up on my screen here. Um, part of our work of being responsible is coming to see the ways in which I have myself have been a high control system and that has distorted my view of my responsibility and actually kept me from myself and my ability to be self-responsible. And the last couple of things I'll share actually came from Jody, um, um, who's now joined us in the room. Welcome, Jody. Um, is that liberation? And Mia, uh, Mia Birdsong talks about this. Liberation is self responsibility, and we see that right now in Israel and Palestine. How individualism has taken form in the shape of a nation state, and how dark it can get. And we see the power of self responsibility in the Palestinian people, the way they have been and continue to take care of each other in the midst of the darkest of circumstances as dark as genocide and the ways they remain connected and committed to the land and each other because they have a sense of self-responsibility to it and to the collective and they know they're not separate. Um, and the last thing that I'll share that also came from Jody is that individualism takes us away from our own essence and coming from the belly of the beast of the war economy that might take us a minute to wrap our minds around because we're told that individualism is a path to our true essence. But when we get some distance from that um, mindset, we see that in reality, it's an addiction that is never satiated. Um, and again, we see that playing out in Israel right now, and it's really taking us away from ourselves. Um, so with that, um, welcome, Jody. We There was a lot of uh, sharing in the beginning, so we're about to go into the, the breakout rooms now. Um, we'll, um, I'll put you in groups of three. Um, I'll do the breakout rooms now. And the breakout room question is, I'll put it in the chat. What's a lie for you around this pivot? What have you learned on your journey so far about it? What excites you about it? And what resistance do you notice to it? Um, and is there an area of your life that you notice yourself consistently pulled towards um, this way of being of individualism? Anything you want to add, Jody, before we go into the breakout rooms? Okay, great. Um, all right. So let's see. We have um, Emily. Yep. So when you say that, when you say this pivot, you're referring to the pivot from individualism to self responsibility, yes. and the distinction between those two. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to be clear. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Um. Let's see. How many breakout rooms? Like Maybe six. Six, okay. Make some fluctuating numbers. All right. All right, and we'll see you back. Um, we'll give you 10 minutes, and we'll do a quick share at the end. If you need help getting to the breakout room too, just um, let me know. Hi, Jody. I got to say, I just love the whole idea of a peace economy. I think it's right. the best thing that could happen for humanity. Well, you know, it's not an idea. It's actually the way humans live for most of, of, of life. <laughs> <laughs> we just kind of like fuck up for 500 years, but we can find our way back. There's lots of paths. <laughs> and there's even people who never left, but... Um, 
So uh, if you everybody can just, all come back, that would be great. The folks can mute, and I know it's so much fun to be together. Um, it's my I'm gonna we're we're presenting to the summer school, and I'm excited. Uh, can we get some muting going on? Okay. Cool. Yay. I'm so sorry that I missed today. Um, I had to facilitate a conversation about China with uh, the Green Party. Um, so, um, you know, I'm so happy to hear you had a robust conversation and I see new faces and new names. And, you know, this piece about um, individualism and self-responsibility is a really big one because First of all, it, it can bring us back to ourselves. And we think individually is ourselves, individualism. But self-responsibility is how we find our way back to ourselves. The self that is us, our community, and the planet. Because in, in self-responsibility, we have a relationship to bigger than ourselves. And that's how we need to live, to be related to life where we live, who we live with, and the conditions that are conducive for life. And I think looking at Israel-Palestine is such an important way to kind of get our minds to relate to this, where individualism is so huge, and you can see the blinding nature, and you can see how it, it hurts. You can feel the, the hurt in your heart, the compassion for living out of hate, and I'm right, and my way of the highway. Or Palestine is a peace economy. It has never been infected with capitalism and the war economy. It is, you know, even in the kafia that um, uh, Emily has on, you know, it's the, the fisherman's net and the olive leaves that, that connect, the, the act of resistance is the connection and the responsibility to the earth. And so, it is the path forward. This is a really important one. It's harder than like understanding transaction and relation, but it is important and it is our own liberation. It is our liberation out of um, out of literal darkness, out of out of addiction, out into the essence of who we are. The essence of each and every one of us is just this amazing being that um, is here to be alive and serve life. And so it's a fun one to practice. It's a little more confusing than the other ones because we it, it takes some refining. And I think next time, after you play with it for a couple of weeks, we can work on what do those refines look like? Because it's a very interesting one. It's like, um, and I think, you know, uh, so it was Corus Socrates' teaching, you know, an unexamined life is not worth living. And so being able to live in paradox, in not knowing, in um, the, the um, complexity that is life has been taken away from us by, you know, everything being black and white. Life is freaking amazing. And when you start to do this work, life is speaking to you every day and to break out of these narrow confines of black and white and yes and no, and this is right and this is wrong into the wild complexity that is life, that, that helps make us wiser, more, more able to help each other, um, better lights for, for people who are in the dark. So I love this one um, because it, it, it um, offers so many gifts when, when you really get a hold of it, um, as so much joy. Um, joy in our, and just being, the joy of being, the joy of life. So um, as I was saying earlier, you know, um, this isn't a new concept. This is indigenous cultures live from this concept all over the world um, that haven't been colonized by war economies and, and empires. And so um, this we're not doing something new. We're doing something that had life continue so that we could be here. You know, and it got co-opted by something that's killing people in the planet, and we can see that, and it's what brings us here. So um, we're cultivating a future together, and I'm deeply grateful that we come together. I'm deeply grateful for uh, what you each do, and in your communities, 
and look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. But I'm sure Emily told you about what's happening next week uh, at the summer school um, for Gaza, where we're going to talk about the encampments, which were an act of resistance that were full on peace economies. And we're gonna have a couple of the students that were at UCLA and GWU to talk about what that felt like, because um, we wanna take this into, you know, oh, that felt so good. Why did it have to go away? But also what happens when you create a peace economy that makes other people really upset because you found something beautiful and oh my, oh dear, we can't find beauty. We won't um, follow the war machine. So until next time, thank you. And thanks Emily for holding it all down. Thanks so yeah. much. Thank you all. Thank you all for your shares. Um, thank can you. Thank you. I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you, um, Emily. Or Jody, yeah, it's Will. Um, yeah, you know that. Um, I am here in D.C. and uh, I'm sorry, I'm here in Baltimore. Tomorrow, I wanted to go into D.C. Um, um, in particular, I, I, I wanted to... at ten o'clock at the Rayburn. But Will, I better see you on Saturday. Um, circling the White House in red. Meet you at uh, Lafayette Park, to the right. Okay of the statue you'll see the pink flag we're gonna arrest the war criminals it's gonna be fun it would be so much fun to be in action with you this weekend fantastic i really want to uh do that i am uh actually here because i'm dog sitting i don't live here um oh, so i'm okay. trying to make that work but uh tomorrow i did plan on going to dc uh, i wanted to see jen yeah she's um, there maybe just to offer some support it's amazing what she's doing so outside of the white house that's where she is all right. Well, I know where to find her then. That should be pretty easy. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, it's just amazing what she's doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Hey, hey, Jody. Yeah. I came, in, I came in the meeting late. Uh, my name is Nicole. I live in Brooklyn. Uh, I was just wondering if there are any code pink caravans going down to DC from Brooklyn. There's a bus. There's a bus, and you can find it at the code pink link at the. Um, if you go to events at Code Pink and, and find the one for the eighth, we have a list of the buses. Oh, really? Fabulous. Yeah. Thank you so much. Of Great. course. I'll see you on Saturday. Yay. Okay. Take care uh -huh. now.